I have something to deliver to you that is very fresh and new and a surprise to me. It is something that was not on my radar. It is something that blew my brain into pieces. And I had to literally, as I was studying, put it away for a little bit. And, and then just, uh, it was too much for me all at once. I had to put it away and, and absorb what the Lord was speaking and what it truly meant and the ramifications of what he was showing me. And then the next day or, or days later, I, I could pick it up again. And, and, and then it would just become too much again. Uh, that's the magnitude of how this impacted me. And so I want to deliver this to you. It affects every individual that is under the sound of my voice, both in this congregation and every person that will ever hear this online. This is for you today. And I want you to receive it from the throne of God. I want you to receive it uh, from the spirit of truth today. And it will at least adjust your perspective on some things if you will do that, if you will receive it. Praise God. I want to do just a tiny bit of review. The Bible says this, that without a vision, where there is no vision, the people perish. What is a vision? It is a supernatural communication from God. That's what a vision is. It is a supernatural communication from God. If you're not going to a church where there is supernatural communication for the vision of where God is leading the church, then that church is probably not dying. It's probably already dead. And I recommend that you find a man of God or a woman of God who will get on their face and fast and pray until they hear from the Lord. And so I want to just look back at where we've been for just a moment. Galatians, the third chapter, the 28th verse. I want to share the roadmap that God has revealed to us so far. And uh, the roadmap that I have referred to often over the last five or ten years uh, was found here in Galatians 3.28. This is what I call the Galatians 3.28 roadmap because this is something that the Lord showed me in my reconciliation time and he showed me that this was taking place. It is a description of what took place from the day of Pentecost and I thought up through where I was but now I know this is up through last generation. I talk a lot about generational revelation. And so I just want to review, because most everybody that goes to this church understands what this is. Uh, Paul laid it out under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he said, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This is a very simple roadmap that began between seven and ten years after the day of Pentecost. Did you know that not one Jew uh, or not one person outside of Judaism received the Holy Ghost for seven to ten years after the day of Pentecost? Nobody outside of the realm of Israel received the Holy Ghost. They were all Jews on the day of Pentecost, all of them. They had come for the Feast of Pentecost. That's why we call that day, the day of Pentecost, it was literally that. And that's why we're called Pentecostals, because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And so we see that uh, they realized, and you can read the story in the book of Acts, uh, they began to realize after the house of Cornelius uh, began to receive the, Holy, the same Holy Ghost that they had received on the day of Pentecost, these Italian people who were not part of Israel uh, began to speak in tongues just like the Jews had seven to ten years earlier, and it just began to, to blow every, everybody's minds. Did you know that revelation will always blow people's minds? Because people get settled in what they think they know. Even if it's a supernatural experience and a supernatural revelation and something that they never thought could be, just wait five or ten years and it just becomes part of uh, their, their fabric of their thinking and the way things are. Those of you that uh, didn't have the Holy Ghost, you thought we were out of our ever-loving minds when you first came to church. Am I telling the truth? Oh, but you got 
in a little bit too close one day and you fell in and the Holy Ghost got a hold of you and you began to speak in tongues just like they did on the day of Pentecost and now you're one of the crazy freaks just like the rest of us. So we need to understand that God has never stopped speaking. God has never stopped revealing. God has never stopped. He didn't stop a hundred years ago at Azusa Street. He didn't stop when he revealed all the things to the reformers. Uh, He didn't stop at any time. He's still speaking to those who will hear the voice of the spirit of revelation. Jesus put it this way to the churches of the end time. He said this in the book of Revelation. He said, let him that has an ear hear what the spirit is saying and listen he is still speaking but you've got to decide I want to hear what he's saying even if it shakes up everything that I thought I knew even if it it causes me to uh, to be separated from people even if it causes me to have to stand up and and to walk in a different direction I still want to hear what the Lord is speaking and so uh we can see that uh, through history that these things have taken place where, um, where the Lord has revealed that, yes, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, bond or free. We went through a time of slavery in this country, the greatest nation that is called a Christian nation. There are more Christians in the United States than any other nation on the face of the earth, yet we had this episode in our history. Oh, but we came to a place where we realized that that was not the way to go. And so we found out that the bond or free, and okay, now we're all right with that. We've come to a place of understanding with that. Now, here's something that maybe some folks weren't quite as comfortable with, and maybe it might take some more adjustment before people get a hold of it, but there is neither male nor female. When you get in Christ, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so the whole church world is still trying to wrap their brain around that, but I'm thankful that it's come and we've received the word of God and now it's time to go ahead and move on amen Amen? that was last generation that was last generation it is only recently that the lord has given me the next part of the road map and you will see uh you know we were already on that road map before the lord revealed it to me but can we go to hebrews the 12th chapter and the second verse and in this part of the road map uh we're going to find the substance of the scripture i'm drawing my message from for today hebrews the 12th chapter and the second verse says this looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith I know Jesus is many things in fact I'm finding out more about him every day I know him as my savior I know him as someone who can put you back together again I know him as somebody that when you think it's all over with that he can rewrite the whole story I know him as somebody that can take a hopeless life and he can breathe brand new hope into somebody's life. He can turn you around. He can work miracles in you. I know him as a strong tower. I know him as a deliverer. I know him as the healer of all of my diseases. I know him as somebody that never turned his back on me, the best friend that I've ever had in this life and throughout eternity. Jesus, I know him as my future bridegroom. Hallelujah. I know him as many things. But in this passage, I want to examine something about Jesus that we only refer to in passing, and that is that he is an author. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. So I want to get personal. I want to to get right in your business today with the word of God. He is the author and finisher of your faith, of your faith. And, uh, and so uh, that's the second verse. That's where I'm going to uh, expand upon and, and draw from today. But I want to go ahead into the roadmap part of this in the very same chapter in the 22nd verse, if you can take me there. Uh, and here's where we find the roadmap after the Galatians 3.28 roadmap. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly 
Jerusalem. Let me stop there for a moment because does that sound familiar to anyone? Where we went after reconciliation. Where did we go? We went into the things of the kingdom of God. We found out that you've got to seek after Basilea. It will not drop in your lap. A basilea is simply the Greek word for the kingdom of God. The reason that the scripture over my head is there day in and day out is because this is the theme of what we have been in for the last five years or so in this church. I wrote a book about it. I didn't bring it out here to show you, but I wrote a book called The Basilea Code, and it is revelation that helps you really understand what Jesus was speaking about the kingdom of God and unlock uh, prophecies, Old Testament, New Testament, and realize many of the mysteries of the things of God. The kingdom, how many know, is a mystery. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. And so we understand that those mysteries are unlocked in the scriptures and, and God is unlocking mysteries in this time. Can anybody say amen? things that you never saw before and and I'm, I mean I'm having to reread and it just seems like that scripture was not in there last week just wasn't there <laughs> that's how I feel about some of the stuff that I'm going to be showing you today but let's look at this so we've come on our journey and we came to the part of no there's neither male nor female in Christ and uh, I shared a scripture with you recently uh, that Paul told the Corinthians from henceforth we're not going to know anyone after the flesh how simple is that I'm not going to consider the flesh but I'm going to know who you really are the inside eternal soul that makes up who you really are. Uh, and so it, it, we came that far. But then we came to this part of the roadmap. We, it has to do with Mount Zion. It has to do with the church. Zion is representative in Scripture of the church. And in conjunction with that, the, exactly how it all works with the kingdom of God. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, if that doesn't sound familiar, that is speaking of those that will rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity. And just in case you thought that every Christian was going to rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years during the millennium, let me ask you just a, a quick question. Who did you think they were going to rule over? If every saved person is going to rule and reign on earth and all the sinners are going to be in their place of judgment, who were we going to rule over? So you see, it is those seeking the kingdom of God. It is those that in this life are saying, Lord, here I am. Here I am. And so we have begun to understand those things. And that's what this, speak, this is speaking of. And then right in the middle of that, because we got our brains around that part and we, we read the book maybe and we started to understand some of that. If you don't have the book, you might want to get it from somebody if you can't afford it or, or get one for yourself. And, and I documented everything. And let me just share with you that everything has to be grounded in the word of God. Paul put it this way. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. If you got a pastor, I don't care who she is or who he is. If they start preaching stuff not in the word, get up, get out and find somebody that is going to preach the word of God to you. So I have been excruciatingly careful sometimes to share scripture after scripture after scripture uh, so that I can support. I mean, I should have been an attorney, but, uh, but God wanted me to be a pastor instead. I'm part attorney, I think, in my thinking process. And so I support everything that I present to you. So you're going to have to argue with the word of God if you want to argue with the revelations that the Lord is pouring out in this time. And you can go ahead and do that on your own time because I don't have to be involved with it. I've just given it all to you and you can just deal with it and, and argue with God all you want. It's his word. I didn't write it. <laughs> so Isaiah put it this way. Here a little, there a little. Uh, it was line upon line. It was precept upon precept. And so what we are receiving is necessary, uh, is necessary the way we're receiving it. It is, it is a precept that you have to have before we get to the next part of the road map. Amen? All right, so here we are. After the Galatians 3.28 road map, here we are continuing on the pathway. And we've come to the issues dealing with 
the church versus the kingdom of God, the church versus the bride of Christ, the church versus who is going to rule and reign in the heavenly Jerusalem. Can you see it? Uh Uh-oh, there's another part of the roadmap that we didn't ask for, we didn't have on our radar, we didn't see it coming, but guess what? It's here because According to this roadmap, as soon as you get your brain around the kingdom of God and the holy Jerusalem and the holy city and the things regarding the church and the kingdom of God, now you're coming up right smack dab up to, look at this, an innumerable company of angels. Angels. What does this mean? Well, (laughs) you can't go over them. You can't get around them. You can't go under them. You can't get between them. So here you are on the road map, and boom, an innumerable company of angels deal with it. And that's what God is speaking to us today. Here you are on the road map. Okay, hallelujah, basilia, this, kingdom of God, that, and boom, an innumerable company of angels. <laughs> Praise God. So I don't know if you like it or don't like it, but it really is beside the point. It's part of the roadmap. It is what God has spoken and chosen, and it is where we are. It is what we're dealing with. Now, I am not, I'm going to refer to the angel part of the roadmap a little bit today in the message, but it is not the theme of my message. Uh, The the word of God tells us this. In fact, let's just go one more uh, scripture here, the 23rd verse. It says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. What is this talking about? The Bible says that he is the firstborn of many brethren. In other words, it is talking about the sons of God. The Bible says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we're going to see him as he is. There's a lot of uh, shady doctrines about manifest sons of God and, and this and that. But listen, I don't want you to compare what I am feeding to the people of God and sharing with the people of God to what you've ever heard anywhere else. Do not compare what God is speaking through this pastor to anybody else. I am not reading books and then trying to massage it into a form that will fit what makes sense to me. I want you to understand something that, yes, I am a reader. Because readers are leaders and leaders are readers. I believe in in reading. And if I wasn't a reader, I could not be the director of a Bible college that forces everybody to do a lot of reading. But can I just share with you from my heart today what has happened? I'm reading three, four books at any given time. I've got, I've got a little area that I, I read, and I've got books piled up. And then I've got another pile of books that I'm ready to get into. So I do believe in these things, and, and God speaks to me through the ministries of others. But can, I just want to honestly, before God, share something with you. As the Lord has been dealing with me and revealing these things to me for you, you know what's happened? It hasn't been, generally speaking, almost always, the, the, it, it has not been the case that I get the things out of the books or, or anything about what he's speaking to me out of the books. But you know what happens? For some reason, you know how it is. Sometimes things come up and you can't read at the, the designated time or, or you, you read a little more in this book and you don't end up reading this book. And you know how that is. It's just, a, it's not always perfectly consistent. But without exception, do you know what God has been doing recently in the last few months? As he reveals something to me and I begin to search the word of God and I put my message together and I preach it and deliver it to you, the very next day many times I will open a book that I have been reading and confirmation after confirmation of what God has spoken to me through other men and women of God is pouring out God has been using these things to confirm his word So I don't know if that's important for anybody, but I wanted to share that to you because God doesn't have to confirm his word. It's true anyway, but he, he loves us. 
And sometimes he gives us the gift of confirming his word. And I want to say this, that the word of God that is going forth into the people of God that are willing to receive it, the people of God that say, Lord, I want to hear what you're saying. I don't pass me by. I want to know what you're doing. I'm not satisfied with the, the, the four or five doctrines that I've been taught all my life. I'm ready, God. And, and I want you to understand, new revelation will never obliterate the truth because because his truth endures to all generations. So if you see somebody come along and they say, well, I just got this revelation and it just undoes all this other stuff. No, you better really take a close look because his truth endures. If it was true then, it's always true. Brand new revelation adds to it. It's, it's precept upon precept upon precept. Are you with me? All right. So... Look at about the middle of this passage here. It says, on the roadmap, we're coming to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, the sons of God. We're learning about that. And the commanders, uh, sons of God, are commanders in the end time army of angels, the heavenly hosts. Uh, and we're learning what that means. We've come to an innumerable company of angels and we're saying, okay, God, what now? What do I do with this? And the Lord is showing us. I'm not trying to act like we know everything about it. We're learning. We're on a journey. If we were at the end, we wouldn't need the road map. But, uh, so, but, but I want you to look at this part. It says, the, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, made perfect. I'm talking about the author and the finisher of your faith. And can I tell somebody that those, uh, those who are seeking the kingdom of God, those who have received their commission to be end time commanders of the armies of God and to fight in the battles uh, uh, in the realm of the spirit, there are stories about you that have already been written in a book. Already been written in a book. Psalm 90 and verse 10 says this. It says that this life is soon cut off and then we fly away. It talks about the lifespan that God gives to us. James put it this way. He said, this life is just a vapor and then it's over with. I don't know if you have ever put the tea kettle on and just watched that steam come up. It's up there just for a second and then it just dissipates and fades into nothing. Well, that's the lifespan that you have on this earth compared to eternity. I want to share something with you. The, the, the word of God said this. We can quote this in our sleep. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. And I'm so focused on the 90 years that I have here or whatever it might be. And that's all there is. And that's all I'm focused on. No, he said everlasting life everlasting life. I want you to keep that with you as we move forward. So uh, Psalm 90 and verse 10, it said, this life is soon cut off and then we fly away. You don't have control over that. It is appointed unto man once to die. And, and if, if you don't lay down your body in death, we're waiting for the trumpet to sound. Amen. And so this life will be over one way or the other. But I want to go to the 12th verse of the 90th Psalm. And I want to show you something here uh, that uh, the psalmist said, he said, so because this life is so fleeting teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom what is the meaning of this life it is to take every single day that God has given to you and apply your heart to the wisdom of God Proverbs the fourth chapter the seventh verse put it this way it said wisdom is the principal thing and along with your wisdom get understanding Wisdom and understanding are the purpose of why you are here. Why would God think it so important that he wants you to number every single day relative to how much wisdom of God is imparted into your life and you seek after? Let me tell you, it's not going to drop in your lap. You're going to have to knock on the door if you want it to open. You're going to have to seek if you want to find. Amen. 
And so why is it that he wants me to measure every single day that he's given me in this life according to how much wisdom and knowledge I can gather in this life? It's because this is simply a training ground. This is nothing but a big time of preparation for you to step in to the next time of your life, which is throughout eternity. Now, if you thought, oh, I'm, I'm planning for this, I'm planning for that, and once I die, oh, who knows what happens. Really? Okay, so you're, you're just, you're all about the training ground, and you just don't, okay. So you understand, measure, measure your days according to wisdom and knowledge. Now, I want to come to uh, another place of how does that happen, the wisdom and the knowledge. Jeremiah, the third chapter, and the 15th verse, it says this. God speaking through Jeremiah tells exactly how the wisdom and knowledge is going to be imparted to those who are ready to receive what God is speaking. It says this, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, I want to present this in the right way. But I want to tell the truth about it. Because according to the word of God, you don't have access to the wisdom and knowledge that you're instructed to seek except through a pastor. And not just any pastor, but a pastor who is after the things of God. It says pastors according to mine heart. Pastors who are seeking the heart of God, seeking the things that God will reveal. So let me, let me just say to you, maybe this is not the church for you. Maybe this is not where God has designated that you would be in the sheepfold here and you would receive what you need. Maybe somebody else is supposed to be your pastor. But whatever you do, you have a decision to make. You better find a pastor that you can follow and that can lead you because you your pastor is your shepherd and the shepherd does not take every blade of grass and put it in the mouth of the sheep and take their jaws and chew it up and then massage it down so that they have to swallow no the the, the pastor or the shepherd is uh, is charged with leading the sheep to the places where they can receive the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Now, so you've got a decision to make. Uh, you better find a pastor that you can follow. You better find a pastor that is feeding you. And understand this, you may think that you're smarter than your pastor. And that's perfectly fine. Maybe you've got more education. I'll just, I'm talking to, to at a, a broader sense, but let me just narrow it to this church. Maybe you think that you're far more intelligent, more educated, uh, more likable, more everything, more spiritual, more amazing than I will ever be. And maybe you are. But can I just share something that you will never change? And that is a matter of access. Because there's only one watchman up on this wall. And you might be down here just serving God and a powerhouse of prayer and anointing and miracles and God using you. And I've been in ministry all these years and I've been doing all this stuff. But there's a man of God that is in a different place with a different perspective and a different anointing and hearing things that you don't have access to except you place yourself in the position of saying, Lord, I don't care how it comes. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for the things that you're speaking. So you might be the smartest. You might, you might be Solomon Jr., but you're not going to get knowledge and wisdom except through the pastor that God has placed over you. Amen. He said, I'll give you pastors. And that is how the knowledge and wisdom is going to come to you. Now, let's go to Psalm 91, the ninth verse.
This is a, a familiar passage for us because it talks about, it starts out, you know, the, the chapter starts out by saying that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And it says, look, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Look at this. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Why is this so important? It's important because uh, this is not just about your foot and stubbing your toe. But this is a revelation and a prophecy about those who are seeking the things of God, who are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and they are abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. This is not talking about the casual acquaintance uh, Christian. This is not talking about the one that goes to church on Easter and on Christmas uh, and maybe Mother's Day and, 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 and the one that just wants to have just a little bit of their finger in the things of God so that they don't have to feel guilty and, and they can get their conscience fixed. No, it's the ones that are dwelling in the things of God. God. Every single day they're existing in him we live and move and have our being. That's who it's talking about. And so David prophesying here, he says this. He said those individuals are the ones that are going to have angels assigned to them. Now, I want to help you understand. I'm talking about the author and the finisher of your book. Uh, the author and the finisher of your faith. Oh, listen, stay with me. It's going to get good in a second. Because, you see, God had a plan for your life. He looked at you and he saw you before time began. And he said, I'm going to take that individual. I'm not going to look at everything that they're going to do wrong. How many know that God knew every bad decision you would ever make? Huh. Wow. That's a little bit scary. But he loved you so much that he wrote your book. And he said, I'm going to trust. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have confidence in them. You're going to see it in a minute. But he said, I'm going to bring them through this road map. Look at that. This woman that should have never come into reconciliation, look at where she is. She kept going and she kept going. Her whole family said, what are you doing? But she kept going on the road map. Look at these people. They should never have been in a church like this. But they were hungry for God. They said, Lord, I'm not done with where you called me to. I want to go. Keep feeding me. Keep speaking to me. And God said, okay, you're knocking. I said I would open the door. You're seeking me. I said you would find me. God will never force revelation down your throat. And so why did I talk about pastor and how arrogant is he? No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me just share with you. <laughs> if you think that it is a real high and lifted up thing and I don't, where is my pedestal? I, I, uh, maybe it's in the back room. <sighs> no, I've never had a pedestal because pastoring those that have done it. It's one of the most humbling things because you find out it's servitude. It's servitude. And you're not just serving God anymore, but you're serving a congregation. You're serving the people of God. You're charged with watching for the souls of the people of God. Do you even comprehend what that looks like? That's why the word of God, I can say without hesitation, the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you because they watch for your soul. Do you know what it feels like? Mothers, I know you do. Do you really understand what it feels like to watch for a soul? <laughs> not, to, not to encourage a soul. Not just to witness to a soul. Not to try to edify a soul. But to watch for a soul. That's what your pastor does. And so thank God for pastors. I love pastors. I have a heart for ministers and pastors because it is something special. And, and so maybe you think I'm demented, but I just feel like I can maybe relate to mothers a little bit through the, the aspect of that calling in my life. Amen. And so 
But I want to show you this, that uh, there are angels that are assigned to those that come into this place, the secret place. Why is it a secret place? Because you, not everybody is going to search until they find it. It is the secret place of the Most High. And if you're not interested in knocking and seeking and going into the things that the Lord is leading, you're not going to know about the secret place. It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody because he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not the ones that come to the altar and, and, and ask for forgiveness and praise God for that. Praise God for that. Thank God for everybody that's saved. But can I tell you, not everybody that goes down to the altar and has their sins forgiven is a diligent seeker of the things of God. I'm sorry, mothers. I just have to preach it and tell the truth today. I can't preach an M is for the many things that they do for us, the kind of message. Not today. And I believe there's some mothers in this church that are hungry for the truth of the word of God and revelation in their hearts today. Hallelujah. So why are the angels assigned to the seekers of revelation, the, the seekers of the kingdom of God, the, the, manifest, uh, the, the manifestation of the sons of God, those that are stepping into command? Why is it that the angels are concerned with their feet? Because the next verse tells us this, that we're going to tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. Can I tell you that Jesus put it this way? He said, behold, all power is in my hand and behold, I give give you power over all the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you because there's authority that is given to the people of God that are stepping into the place of anointing and seeking the, the things of God. Your feet and putting your feet on the enemy. These things, I don't have time to go into it and I've, I've addressed this in other messages, but the lion, the adder, all of these are representative of uh, demonic and satanic powers. Uh, the enemy uh, roams to and fro like a lion, right? Seeking whom he may devour. We see that uh, all of these are representative of the powers of the enemy. But can I tell somebody today, he's already defeated. He's already defeated. And there are angels that are assigned to guard your authority. Hallelujah. And your calling and your commission. This isn't talking about, you know, uh, angels assigned to little kids somewhere so they won't stub their toes. No, it's the, those that have sought after the secret place of the Most High. And those who are coming into this place of an innumerable company of angels. There are angels assigned. And let me tell you something. Get, get, get your mind ready. Those angels have existed for many, many years many thousands of years those angels existed before the world was created and they've been waiting all this time for you to come into the secret place of the most high God so that they could be assigned to you Yeah, that puts it in a little bit different perspective. It's not some willy-nilly, okay, need another angel, another angel up, angel up. Who's in the queue? I'm going to show you that God was very specific in this assignment. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so how do these angels know about us? If they've been waiting all these thousands of years to serve us and to come into our command, somebody uh, expressed something the other day that, well, are we supposed to pray to angels? No, the angels are not for you to pray to. That's where you get into false doctrine. The Bible said this, Paul put it this way. He said, if I or an angel from heaven come to you preaching any other thing than the gospel that has been preached to you, let him be accursed. I want to tell you that Mormonism came from an angel. I want to tell you that Islam came from an angel from hell. I want to tell you that there are many false doctrines that have come from angels. And when human beings 
beings placed themselves in a position after Pentecost to hear anything from angels. It's going to be nothing but false doctrine. An angel is not supposed to deliver truth to you. The Holy Ghost inside of you is the spirit of truth. The gifts of the spirit are revealing the things of God in this day and hour. And God has caused you to be in charge of the angels. Amen. Paul put it this way. He said, don't you know that the angels, you're going to judge angels. Does that mean that you're going to, you, you know, you're going to, okay, you're, you, go to, you go to hell and lake of fire and you don't. No, no, no. That's already been decided. You're not going to have any part in that. The angels that rebelled did that a long time ago. They're, the Bible said they're already reserved in judgment. So you're not going to have any part of that. Judge, it means to command. That word judge means to command in the Greek. And he said, you're going to command angels you're going to have command over angels and there is a command structure and whether you like it or not here we are on the road map you come up to an innumerable company of angels deal with it okay we're trying lord here we are that's where we're at so those who are saying okay i'm not going to just turn around and la 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 you know plug my ears and and pretend that this isn't here those that are trying to receive information, here's another part of it today. How do those angels that have been waiting for thousands of years to be assigned to the commanders that they're going to be attached to through the rest of eternity? Come on, somebody hear me today. Because those who are ruling and reigning with Christ are going to do that throughout eternity. And why do we have angels assigned to us? Because they live in the realm of the Spirit. They've been in the realm of the Spirit and the things of heaven for their entire existence and they are in the presence of God in a pure and holy way that we're not going to know until we're lifted out of these bodies and we see him face to face but they've been there they know the things of God and they know the ways of the Lord but I want to add something to that because there is a library in heaven of books that have been written about everything in your life and the plans that God has in your commission and in your calling and in the anointing and in every aspect of your walk with God and your journey. The story's already been written. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. And I would submit to you that your angels have been studying your story for thousands of years. Your angels have been looking into, the Bible said that the, the angels desire to look into salvation. It never said that they don't get to. I want to tell somebody, they have a desire to look at the blood bought, the lives of the redeemed, and how God has chosen to use them and to bring them to a place of ruling and reigning from rags to riches, from some Somebody that didn't deserve it, but the price was paid. They were redeemed. They were bought with a price, and the angels have desired to look into it. I would submit to you that they have looked into it. I would submit to you today that your angels, the thousands and, and maybe hundreds of thousands or millions, it says innumerable, so pick a number, that have been waiting to be assigned to you. They've been spending time in the libraries of heaven and they've been reading your book and they've been seeing the plans that God has for you. Not the person next to you, but the plans that he has for you. I want to show this to you. I want you to pay attention. Psalm 139 and verse 13. Come on, somebody get excited with me today. The word of God is here to change your heart and your life and to bring understanding and wisdom to you today. Look at this. Here's what David said. He said, for thou hast possessed my reins, my inward parts. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Get ready. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Thank God for the revelation that he never makes mistakes. Not one time. Not one time. Hallelujah. Take a look at this. My substance was not hid from thee. Huh. You knew who I was going to be. 
when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. <sighs> when we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Hallelujah. He didn't wait for you to get good. He went to Calvary anyway. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. What does that mean? It means before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. I know we read Jeremiah a lot that he said that you knew me before I was born. But look at this. David goes further. He says that your hand was upon me in the womb. But even before I began to be formed in my mother's womb, Lord, you wrote a book about me before I existed, before I began to be knit together in my mother's womb so that I could have a life so that I could have a time of learning and preparation that would lead me into my place in eternity. You already had written everything in a book about me. You wrote a book about me. You're the author <laughs> and the finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. The author and the finisher of my faith. Look at uh, verse 17 here. It says this, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Right after it talks about the book that was written, it says, How precious are your thoughts. That word in the Hebrew means purpose. Purpose. You might be familiar with the scripture that we, we use often in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 11th verse. Here's what God said. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace, not thoughts of evil. To give you an expected end. Come on, stay with me today, church. To give you an expected end. I know the thoughts, God says, that I think toward you. The word of God says in Philippians, he that hath begun a good work in you. He had a purpose for you. He had a work that he decided to do in you. It said, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. How long? Until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that he's speaking of the work that ends either when the trumpet sounds or when you lay down your body. Amen. So there is a work uh, underway and in process that is preparing you for the next place that you will exist. I'm living this life just to live again. Amen. So how precious also are your thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. That word in the Hebrew in Jeremiah, it means the same thing. Purpose and plans. And so what he's saying is, I know the plans. Stick with me here. I know the plans that I have for you, and you can't get around it. The previous verse here, verse 16 in Psalm 139 said, I wrote a book about the plans that I have for you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. But the book has already been written. Come on, somebody. Get a hold of the magnitude of what I'm telling you today. He knew everything about where you would be. He knew the body that you would be placed in and the situation that that would cause you to step through in your life. The challenges, the good times, the bad times, the struggles, the storms. He knew everything about you because he wrote a book about the plans that he has for you. But the last part of that passage in uh, Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, it said, I, I know the thoughts that I have for you to give you an expected end. I want to ask you a question. Why wouldn't that be a, a foregone conclusion end? I know the thoughts I have, the plans I have, and I'm just going to make it happen. And here's the end. No, he said, I'm going to give you an expected end. Why? Because I've already told you there's a book written about you, but I want to show you in scripture, the book is open and the story is under constant revision. 
So God has an expected end for you. He knows the beginning from the end. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. And he's got a plan for your life. Don't you doubt it, not for one second. He never stopped having a plan. He never stopped working his plan in you. However, your story is under constant revision. That's why the end is an expected end. You know, some of us love those movies and stories where there's a big old plot twist right at the end. Just turns everything upside down. Hallelujah. I would say some of us have already had a plot twist that caused some heads to explode in the church world because they thought the end had already come. They thought that it was over. They'll never have a ministry. They'll never serve God. They'll never win souls. They'll never be healed. They'll never be used of God anymore. Oh, but look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Because he had a plan. He wrote the book. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Romans, the 8th chapter and the 29th verse, it says this, Whom he did foreknow, him he also did predestinate. To what? To be conformed to the Son of God. In other, word, to, in other words, it says to become a son of God. It says that, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. It's talking about the sons of God. It's talking about the commanders of the end time army. That's Romans 8, 29. It may be familiar with you. Some of you may have scratched your heads and said, what is predestination? Does it mean that I don't have any choice in the matter? No, it means that there was a book written about you. It means that God had a plan for you and he chose you to be a son of God, a commander commander of angels, uh, uh, someone in the bride of Christ, somebody that would seek Basilea, who would rule and reign without, uh, throughout all of eternity. But let me share something with you. I want you to pay attention. Pay attention. Ephesians, the first chapter in the fourth verse. The Romans passage, maybe some of you uh, know that and can quote that, but I want you to look at Ephesians, the first chapter. I'm telling you, get ready, get ready. Look at this. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You did not stumble into what you know about God. But he chose you before, not just before you were born, not just in the womb, but before time began, before the world was, oh my God, get a hold of this today. He has plans for you. He has a book written about your life and about your story. Uh, We've got to continue here. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Why, why adoption? Because we who were not sons have become the sons of God. To those that received him gave he power to become the sons of God. They didn't start out as sons, but there was a process that took place, a process of adoption. He chose you. He ordered you, uh, this in your life. He predestined you so that you would follow the pathway. But can I tell you, it's always been up to you. You've got something called free will. That's why it's an expected end, because every decision that you make in your life is impacting whether you're on track or off track. He's got a place of glory for you. He's got a place of authority for you. He's got a place of majesty for you to rule and reign with him. But let me give you an example of some individuals called by God whose disobedience changed the story for them. Just a couple real quick. You know a man named Moses. I talked about him last week. And Moses was called by God. But there were some things that he just didn't like about the the way that God wrote his book and wrote his story. I mentioned last week he didn't want to be the mouthpiece. And he said, God, no, I can't do it. And God got tired of hearing his moaning and complaining and said, okay, fine. Then then get your brother up there and he's going to be your mouthpiece. There there are several things that Moses did. He, He struck the rock a couple of times when he was commanded to speak to the rock. But I want to tell you that disobedience cost him. Because it was never God's ending in his book for Moses and an entire generation to die 
in the wilderness before the survivors stepped across the Jordan into the promised land. Hear me today. Those acts of disobedience, they didn't disqualify Moses from being a used and and a wonderful man of God that we read about and and draw inspiration from and, and all the miracles and all the things. It didn't cause him to stop being somebody that wanted to see the glory of God. It didn't stop him. As a matter of fact, God's not even done with Moses because the word of God said he's still going to make one more appearance. He's coming back as one of the the, the prophets that are going to come and we won't get into all that, but God is not done with Moses. We can see that Moses appeared even when Jesus was being transfigured, that Moses came back for another appearance and so God is even still not finished with Moses. But my point here is that his, his disobedience cost him. It could have been so much more. It could have been so much more. David, the most beloved king, the, the man who was after God's own heart, the one that wrote the very Psalms that we are dealing with today, David, the king that was chosen of God, David, the one who, who was, was intimate with the things of the Spirit of God and worship and, and wrote the things that we know about to our worship even today, he caused some things in his life through disobedience. And did you know that David, not Solomon, was supposed to build the temple for the Lord. David was the one. But God said, no, because you've chosen a bloody way. You've chosen the way of the sword. You've chosen the things that I didn't plan for you. I didn't write that. Some of you have insisted on things in your book. And God has spoken to you and said, I didn't write any of that. But if you insist on it, I've given you free will. But let me give you a warning. It's going to change the end of your story. It's going to change the end of your story. And so David was not allowed to build the temple, but his son Solomon built the temple. And there are many things that we could point to that uh, David had to suffer. He had death of of various children, all kinds of tragedies that perhaps could have been averted except for his uh, times of disobedience. And so I, I just want to point that out to you that God has written a book, but the ending is still open. He's written it, but it's only an expected end to your story. Amen. Are you with me, church? Amen. Hallelujah. So, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, so, so he has predestined us, predestinated us. Take a look with me a little further in this chapter. Look at verse 9. It says this. Watch. Watch this. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both in heaven and which are in earth even in him This is exactly what we are experiencing today. I want you to understand something. The Bible says, uh, and we quote the scripture and sing songs about it. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. It says, I hath not seen, neither hath ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things that God has for those who love him. Right? We sing about it. We quote it. But the next verse, verse 10, goes on to say, but God has revealed it to them through his spirit. And so I want you to understand and yes, we can't comprehend the magnitude of the things of God, but the Holy Ghost is speaking and is revealing them to us. Look at that passage that we just went through. Verse 9, it says, Having made known unto them, unto us, the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure. I would tell you today, God is pouring out the, the, the revelation and the explanation and the wisdom and the knowledge of what he wrote in your book. He's pouring out the destiny that he has given to you. If you really want to know what God has called you to, let me explain something to you. When you get a call from God on your life, some of us got called to ministry when we were kids. People sitting right here with minister's license got called in junior church or got called in some service and they were just kids. There was absolutely no way they were going to get an RV and get on the road and start preaching revivals all across the land. 
<laughs> but somehow they knew they were called. Somehow you couldn't convince them otherwise. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. You couldn't convince them otherwise. They just knew. And God revealed a part of the book. Even in that place, you couldn't have been called to ministry except a portion of your book was revealed. And so I'm here to tell the people of God who are receiving revelation, who are hearing the things that are being poured out in this day and time, that God, like no other time in all of our history, is pouring out to revelation and he's he is giving us the mysteries of his will that he's written in the book i've got to move on we're coming to a close here but i want to go to a few passages in the book of revelation let's go to the 10th chapter in the 8th verse because i i want to substantiate this book thing and i want to substantiate what i said about your angels have already had access to know everything about god's plan for you the scripture that we uh, talked about uh, psalm 91 it said that he's given his angels charge over you does that mean that they're going to command you no but that word charge means he's given them authority to protect you and to guide you in all your ways look it up to guide you in all how do they know about your ways because they've spent time in the library of heaven and they've seen the plans they already know the things that God has planned in your life the anointing the miracles the deliverance the revelation that he has in your book they're ready they're ready you're not going to have to tell them what to do you're not going I have to tell them how to guide you. They know everything in your book before you ever get a hold of it yourself. And we're going to see that in just a second. Revelation, the 10th chapter, the 8th verse. Now, there's a lot of angels with a lot of books and seals and all that stuff. But my, my attention was drawn to this particular passage because it seems disjointed in the sequence of events that we see John the Revelator experiencing through visions and through his spirit being taken into the third heaven and all, all of these different things that happen in the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, the Lord in the first chapter had appeared to him and, and said, I'm the Alpha, the Omega. I'm the one that was dead and now I'm alive forevermore. That's me. I'm the one that you laid your head upon. I'm the one that you walked with and now here I am alive forevermore. And then he said this. He said, John, get a pen because you're going to take some notes and you're going to take some dictation and you're going to write some things that are going to be passed on for generations, thousands of years from that time. And can I tell you, all of that happened when he was exiled in a place of punishment for preaching the word of God when he was ostracized and set aside on the Isle of Patmos. That's when all this happened. And so in the middle of all that, here's what happened. And the voice which I heard. Now, you can go back and you can see what happened. The Bible said that a very strong angel appeared unto him. A very strong angel appeared unto him and had a book in his hand. The angel had a book in his hand. And so look at this. It says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel. So we have a little book and it's open. And where is it in the loving hands of God? No, it is in the hand of the angel. And so the voice from heaven said, go get the book, go take it from the angel take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth and I went unto the angel and I said unto him give me the little book and he said unto me take it eat it and it's going to be bitter in your belly but it's going to taste like honey in your mouth and so I took the little book out of the angel's hand again it's in the angel's hand it's open in the angel's hand it's a little book a little book. What does this signify? It's not the book that has every name written down. It's not the book about everybody on the face of the earth that will ever exist. It is not that book, but it is a little book. And it's a book which is open. And, and so it said that I took it, I ate it up, 
and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And then soon, as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said, look at this, watch this. If you're wondering what the book is, the angel explained it. He said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And I would again submit to you today that we're seeing a picture of the book that was written by God about the ministry and the life of John the Revelator. Because the angel, you know, if you read uh, uh, up in the early verses of this chapter, it said that that he heard the angel talking about the book and he started to write it down. And the angel said, no, don't write that. It's not for anybody else. So what is it? It's explained right here. It is the book that explained what was going to happen in his ministry. As we know, he was right there at the end. Can you believe that God still had something for John, even in the Isle of Patmos? He said, you're going to prophesy to many nations, peoples, even kings. And of course, we know he did that through everything in the book of Revelation. So we see here a little book, and the book is in the angel's hand, and the book is open. I want to quickly go, come on, Brother Nate. I want to quickly go through a couple more uh, passages here. Revelation, the 20th chapter and the 12th verse. I want to just show you something here because perhaps like me, you found out about the book of life through hymns that were sung when you were a little kid. In the book is written, saved by grace. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. And uh, there's a new name written down uh, and and, and just talks about things in the book of life and and, um, tracts and messages. But we got some things wrong. At least I got some things wrong. Look at this. And I saw the dead. This is 20 and 12 in the book of Revelation. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And then, in in addition to those books, yet another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works according to their works you see your whole story has already been written and you're being judged according to your works jesus said in the book of matthew that we're going to give account for every idle word if you think your book isn't open for revision (laughs) every idle word your book is still open it's already been written (laughs) lord help us I won't go to this passage, but Exodus, the 32nd chapter, we talked about Moses. Moses came to a point after the golden calf episode where he came down from the mountain and the people of God were worshiping the Satan and worshiping an idol that had been uh, built up and he was so angry. But you know what? He wasn't the only one that was angry. God was ready to just just obliterate all of Israel. He was going to kill them all right then and there. And Moses stepped up and he did something very interesting. He said, God... You're the one that brought us across the Red Sea. And what are people going to say? What is the legacy of the people of God going to be if you destroy us now? If you destroy them? And God said, no, no, Moses, you got to understand something. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy them. You didn't do that. They did that. And I'm going to destroy them. And then I'm going to build up another people. And that's what God was ready. If you think he was bluffing, no, God was ready to obliterate all of those people who were worshiping Satan and worshiping that golden calf. But Moses, Moses stood in the way and he said, no, Lord, if you're going to kill them, watch this. He said, Exodus 32, 32, blot my name out of your book. Before Calvary, Moses was already written in the book. Before Jesus died for his sins and there was no salvation until Calvary, Moses' name was already written in the book. And listen, here's I need you to understand this. The book is not blank waiting for your story to be written, but the book is already filled in and your name is already there. And it's only the ones who turn from God whose names are blotted out. 
the next verse goes on to say God says no I will not blot your name out I will only blot the names of the sinners out of my book so I want you to get this we had it backwards there's a new name written down in glory no I beg to differ it's not a new name it was written before the foundation of the world God has called you God had a plan for you he had thoughts for you he had an expected end written in your book before the world began there's an old name written down in glory and it's mine and God thought about me before I was born and before the world began already uh, I'm already in his book he's already written my story Revelation 3 5 just two more scriptures just two more scriptures Revelation 3 5 he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess that word also means profess his name before my father and oh yeah before his angels let me ask you why would Jesus need to profess my name before his angels <laughs> I think it goes a little something like that angels meet Doug Clinton he's your commander commander meet your angels <laughs> because it's written in the book it's written in the book hallelujah hallelujah I want you to stand with me today I want to share one more scripture in closing your book is open it's being revised it's already been written but it's being revised according to your obedience according to your decisions that you make according to the seeking of the things of God in your life Malachi the third chapter the 16th verse look at this then they that feared the Lord go to my message if you're online go to my message about fear that I preached recently they that feared the Lord spake often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name come on somebody it's only the ones that fear God that are going to be the commanders of angels, the ones that are going to take their place on the thrones with God to rule and reign. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Listen, you can't get away from everything that's meshed within all of these scriptures. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're in the bride of Christ, you're not going to spend one second in the judgment that is coming to this world. Not one second. If you're in the bride of Christ, you're going to be taken off this world, out of this world when the trumpet sounds. And it's his jewels. It is those seeking the things of God that he is going to spare. Hallelujah. So today, I want you to consider this. God thought so much of your future that the creator of all things wrote a book about you. He wrote a book about you. Hallelujah. And today, he's just waiting for you to ask, Lord, would you reveal to me some of the things about your will in my life and the book that you wrote about me. He's waiting to reveal those mysteries to you. Maybe you thought that that wasn't accessible or maybe that wasn't something that was uh, in God's plan for you to understand, but I come. I've shown you in the passages of Scripture. Listen, I'm not trying to force anything on anybody. As a pastor, I just lay out the stuff that God gives to me. You can pick it up or you can stomp over it and, and trample on it and say that's ridiculous, but listen, if you're going to have wisdom and knowledge from God, if I'm not the one that can lead you to it, you better find somebody that can because God is speaking and God is moving and God is coming to a place where everything is going to wind up. He said, I'm going to work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. The passage that I started with today, very early in this message was this, that we have an appointed time and then we're going to fly away. <laughs> Then we're going to fly away. And then that's all there is as far as what you are going to be able to do in preparation today. Amen. So 
I know this is a lot. You've got a book written about you. Maybe they'll turn it into a movie someday. I don't know. Probably depends on the decisions that you make. Praise God. But God loves you so much. And he's never stopped working in your life. And he's got a plan for you. And he knows the thoughts that he has for you to come to an expected end. Amen. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising 